I want to welcome you, you to, I think it's the 922nd meeting, if we count these July meetings. So I'm just going to say we're going to count it, okay? So, uh, and uh, we're going to do a sh an abbreviated business meeting, and then we'll have presentations by Corey George and Rich Lincoln. Uh, Tom, just hit the enter button uh, or try to try and try the enter button. Press the button. So um, Glenn said that he didn't have too many things um, throughout the summer, but um, Mercury's the greatest western uh, elongation in the morning. That might be pretty good to look at if you're up that early, 30 to 40 minutes before sunrise. Uh, of course, the Perseids uh, peak. However, this year there's an almost full moon in the sky, um, so that's going to really drown out any but the brightest of the Perseids. Um, and Neptune is in opposition on September 10th. You know, if you never looked at the outer planets, um, come to the club uh, sometime in, in the autumn. We look at them all the time. And with some of the bigger telescopes, we look at the moon, uh, Triton, uh, the moon of Neptune, and some of the brighter moons uh, surrounding the Uranus. So that's a lot of fun. If you've never seen those things before, come up to the club uh, some Friday or Saturday night and just ask. If we haven't pointed the telescopes at them yet, ask. Um, also, I put in the newsletter and I also sent out an e-blast uh, regarding Jupiter's Great Red Spot and also Ganymede uh, Shadow Transits coming up this summer. So um, that's some stuff to look at. The Red Spot is actually fairly prominent this summer and um, you can see it with almost any telescope. Uh, the bigger the aperture, the more color you'll see. It's like an orange jelly bean uh, on the South Equatorial Belt. So it looks pretty good actually. You should check it out. Um, the Observer's Challenge is NGC 6482, which is an elliptical galaxy in Hercules. So, um, not the easiest thing to find. So, um, it's not particularly bright. What's that? Lenticular. It's a lenticular galaxy. Okay. That's your image, that right there, isn't it, yeah. Mario? And uh, it's, um, it's, it's a bit of a challenge to see. It almost looks like a planetary nebula because uh, there's a, 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 I think it's a 12th magnitude star that's right like on top of the, uh, the galaxy. But um, again, come up to the clubhouse, we'll show you that. Mar Mar is the orientation correct between the chart? Yes. It is? Okay. Yeah, it is. This is a little triangle of stars that you look for in here, and then you can see the fuzzy patch of light here. Not the same scale. No, it's not no. the same scale. Okay. And you don't see that triangle over there, but it's a, the, the, the location on the sky is relatively easy to get to. But then you have to see it. It's actually a relatively faint galaxy to look at. So you need a vertical gaze because it acts like the blink of planet mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that stuff. Yep. And you, but you can see it. So but that's that's a, a, wait, that's at the same orientation between the chart and that photo? The Maybe slightly tilted, but like I said, when we when we were looking at this up at the clubhouse uh, two weekends ago, this was the triangle of stars that we were looking for right here. And then once we were on this triangle, then we we knew we had the object. Can you point yes. up yeah. on the on the star? I don't right? think they're over there. I mean, it, that that oh, is too right. crude of a map. Yeah. Yeah. The other right. recommendation is use high power. So it, I was using a 10 inch the other last week, and you could kind of see it at eight, you know 80 power, but if you went further, it was actually more visible. The darker your skies, the better. Otherwise, it'll just melt into the background, and um, that will be that. But it's a fun little object. Um, August is a little bit easier. It's M11, so um, I'm not sure we now going to absorb that um, again because it's awesome. This is Doug Paul's image, and that's a sketch that Glenn made through his 10-inch telescope. And um, it's um, it's a it is a challenging object to look at, no doubt about that. But um, have fun with that. It's good. It's send a report to Roger. He loves getting new people. I think that, that's, that's the end of our business meeting, but uh, we're going to start um, with Alan Slitsky. He's going to give us a little introduction on his tour of, um, of Chile and the Eclipse. So you might want to turn down the lights, do you think? Yeah. Good to start. at Williams College, and we were with him in uh, Salem, Oregon for the 2017 eclipse. And I guess we did a good enough job. 
that um, he decided he would uh, give us a spot on the mountain here. So this is the Google Earth view of CTIO. This, uh, they blew off the top of the mountain at 7,200 feet, and we were set up right here. So we had a view to the west, and from that elevation, the horizon is 165 kilometers out. So we had a, we had a good view. Mm -hmm. uh, CTIO and part of the Williams College science team, and supported by these uh, organizations. And we had the four teams of five scientists set up on there and from different parts of the world. We had a Greek fellow, one from the Solar Observatory in Colorado, uh, Japanese uh, solar observers from Hawaii. So we had a good mix. So this is on the road uh, from La Serena, which is on the coast, uh, hitting, it's about an hour and a half drive up the mountain. And so it's a group of the stars. So I um, just want to give you a very brief tour of some of the observatories. This is the Victor Boinko 4 meter telescope, which is twin to the point of 50 feet. Uh, it's a very large telescope installed in the 70s, and the structure is huge compared to the size of the telescope by today's standards. Uh, these are some of the other telescopes on the top. On the left is a 36-inch polar Chivins made for CTIO. The next little dome is that it's a brand new dome with a brand new plane wave one meter in it. And then the two domes on the right are a 40-inch, it was originally at Yale, and a one and a half meter. We got a tour by the observatory director of uh, the next mountain over, uh, Cerro Patron, where uh, LST is under construction. We'll get a very nice tour inside and out. Uh, that's the size of the building. My son David is with me. And this is uh, Gemini South, another uh, eight meter telescope uh, nearby. And that's, again, the size of the machine. Quite something. Uh, there's a small four meter telescope. As well, unlike Boston, where you can't see a couple hundred feet without trees, here you can see hundreds of miles in every direction all the time. And this is what it looks like looking down towards the ocean. It's just an unbelievable view all the time. And that's uh, CTIO from LSST. So that's uh, 10 kilometers away. Oh, what's the altitude? At LSST, it's about 9,000 feet, and CTIO is like 7,200. And there, that's about where the snow line is in the winter, so LSST gets more, much more snow. When we got there, we got there like five days ahead of time. We had lodging on the mountain. And it was cold, and it was blowing 50 miles an hour. We were thinking that if it was going to stay that way, we weren't going to see anything. But um, that system came through, blew everything out, and we had perfectly clear uh, skies and uh, pleasant weather in those winters. So we were in one of four little houses that were originally built for astronomers when people, when astronomers would go to the mountain and use film glass plates and they would come with their families and stay for months. Uh, so we had a nice view of the little patio. <coughs> um, so this is our clips rig that uh, was shipped from, uh, we shipped it from here to UPenn and then UPenn to Tucson and then there's a special arrangement with the observatory uh, crew where they get discounted shipping and special treatment and customs. So just, we, we ship it and it appears on the mountain. Who, who owns the power mountain now? Uh, that is my son's. It was actually purchased with a grant from uh, Sigma Psi. So we now have a, a little Paramount Mighty that we can take with us. This is some of the other people. They had uh, about 150 VIPs. They bust up the day of the eclipse. Excuse me, did you see Bernie Bolts? 
I did not see Bernie Holtz. I don't know. If, I don't think he was, he was on that. He was in a different observatory, I think. Yeah, yeah, he was in a different observatory. Yeah, Kip Thorne was there uh, with the crowd. We met him. Uh, there's my son David with our flip streak. So we have uh, six, five, and four, six, five, four, three inch telescopes of, of various focal lengths. And our what we want to do is be able to assemble the eclipse images not only from one telescope where we have uh, 25 sets of nine exposures during the eclipse, but we're hoping to be able to synthesize an image using all four focal lengths. That's uh, the paramount. Well, you said we set up two days ahead of time, and we did a polar alignment, you know, the pointing model, so we got everything dialed in nice, and we just left the equipment there out in the open for two days. The 36-inch telescope that's in the dome in the back, when that was sent to see TIO, there was no building, so they just set it up outside. It doesn't, it doesn't, no precipitation. So that's a view at the quarter mile after first contact. That was our view to the west. Their second contact, uh, assuming I looked at fairly closely. You can see some nice prominences. There are absolutely no sunspots, but we have nice prominences. And if you get closer in, you can see uh, a lot of that detail. We were able to, we used a program called Solar Eclipse Maestro, which automates all the picture taking. So we were able to watch the eclipse <laughs> while all the cameras operate. This, this now is only the second time. We did it in uh, Salem, Oregon. But it's great because you can sit down and watch the eclipse. I had my image stabilized binoculars. That's fantastic. So that's sort of a mid-eclipse picture with uh, Tele-D-127. And again, no, we haven't done any contrast enhancement or stuff here yet. We haven't, we haven't had time. Uh, and this is the shortest of the nine exposures. Um, we were able to look through our last set of pictures because we have basically the same camera, same telescopes, and we could adjust the exposures. We found that the chromosphere, which is the pink part you see, was overexposed. So we, we went one stop faster, and now we have nicely exposed. So we were able to very, it took us, we took four days to <laughs> fine tune everything. And, uh, but it was really good to have the other set of images to work with. So this third contact, and that's with a, we had a, a camera set up with a wide angle lens doing a frame every uh, five seconds or so. That's the shadow. And you know, we could see it coming. <laughs> and uh, it was uh, quite nice. And actually this, if I could get it to work, I got the I got the cursor on this screen. Yeah, so just uh -huh. it didn't work. Oh, no, that's so anyway. Uh, that's our composite image from the 2017 eclipse. We hope do better than that. That's it. Thanks. There's a chair next to you, an empty chair. There's a chair here. With or without the place. Yeah. 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 Where are you? Where are you? But not the VIPs. Oh, I want to go. Okay. Anyway, that's the first attempt we have until it was the enclosure. How long was your totality? 
two, uh, two minutes, six seconds, something like that. Is that last frame after third contact? Yes. Yeah, that's all the way through the eclipse. And then you can see the shadow raising up after third contact. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
is the modern separate driver that does multi or uh, micro stepping to like 32 micro steps. The stepper motor moves sort of incremental degrees. It's not like a servo that just continuously goes. And the older mounts, they drive them in whole steps and it's very clunky. So the way they get around that is they have a very high gear ratio. So it smooths out those little steps. But with the modern drivers, they, they do that kind of electronically and they, they very smoothly go from one voltage to another. So that little driver takes the place of all the rest of the circuitry in the same Yeah, one? and it's better. Which is, it's just crazy. And it's, it's cheaper. It's, it's high power, power, too. Yeah, you have to really heat sink them if you're going to drive um, loads. Usually the small motors are only like 1.6 amp at 12, 12 volts. Uh, but it, they're really easy to work with. And these drivers work with all sorts of motors. You don't have to be super critical about mixing and matching. Um, these are a couple examples of things that people have converted with OnStep. Uh, so you see you have like a homemade pipe mount, Equatorial, a really nice Takahashi, a really nice Astrophysics. Uh, the project was born from uh, motorizing the bus man mount. And here are some homemade Dobsonians motorizing all the azimuth and this is one of the, the smart hand controllers. I, I didn't build one of those. All these were pulled off the uh, build blocks online. So for my build, I bought a, uh, a used German equatorial head from cellophane last year. This is an old Vixen or Celestron Super Polaris. And it actually came with the uh, an ancient sky sensor go-to system. It's so old that if you want to punch in, if you want to go to M42, you can't just punch an M42. You go to the index in the back of the book, look up the register number, and punch that in, and then it slews there at half a degree per second. And Ten minutes later, you'll get there. So uh, I quickly stripped that off the mount. But uh, the only problem with this mount is it didn't come with a tripod, and the head is an older style that just bolts directly to tube rings to stay on the telescope. So not very useful for my sort of modern, smaller telescopes to use fixing dovetail clamps. So I used uh, some 3D printing and some casting to make a dovetail adapter. So this I designed in CAD has the two bolt holes that align up with where the tube rings used to be, and it has uh, an overhang for the dovetail. So this part was 3D printed, some light sanding, and uh, sort of finishing work done to it. And then it's used to create an impression in the sand mold, and then Molten aluminum is poured into the impression and the part pops out of the sand. Did you do that yourself? Yeah. So th these are, this is sort of the stuff I talked about last year, sort of the 3D printing and sand casting. This is kind of like a capstone project that's using it all together. Um, so I'm, I'm having a blast doing this. And so after some filing, sanding, drilling, tapping, and painting, it looks pretty good on the mount. It, on the, the little thumb screws there, it's just a normal hex bolt with a 3D printed thumb grip. You press it on and it works out pretty good. Uh, so that's the head, the ducktail bar sorted, and I need to get tripod work for it. And I had an old surveyor's tripod, and I was planning to make an adapter plate or a bushing to get the bores to match, but coincidentally they're exactly the same size and fit perfect, so I lucked out on that. So all I had to do was make a sort of a, a stud for the azimuth polar alignment adjustment. So I just drilled a hole and bolted a little aluminum bar to it. And I had to come up with a clamp, so I just 3D printed a cup and a uh, handle for a hex bolt, and that worked out. So at this point, I had the dovetail sorted, the tripods, tripod sorted, and it's sort of ready to go at a baseline for the beyond step conversion. So first thing I did was design and 3D print some motor mounts. The Vixen Vixen mount has uh, just these rectangular sort of receivers with some set screws. So the motor mounts, you can see how this bar, and that just fits into the existing mounts receivers and you tighten it down and it's ready to go. And I was using uh, some timing belts and pulleys. And 3D printing has also caused the, the price of those things to come down. Just It's incredible you can get this whole set of belt pull and two pulleys is probably like six dollars from eBay. It's insane how they can even make that shit. But uh, 
So after I have the motors in a, a mount that'll adapt to the fixing head, I had to sort of breadboard the electronics, and there's a whole bunch of schematics online and a bunch of information from other people's builds, and they have sort of a bomb, a bill of materials of what components you need to get, and the total price for all the electronic bits and doodads are probably like 40 to 50 bucks for all the pieces. And after I verified that it worked the way they said it would work, then I sort of committed it to a perf board and soldered it in a more permanent uh, setting. Uh, I've got a fuse there too, because I made mistakes. And, uh, the easy alternative to this, this is probably the most uh, labor intensive and sort of study intensive where you have to reference schematics and make sure you're not connecting the wrong things to the wrong thing. It, uh, an alternative is to just buy a motherboard for a 3D printer and the OnStep project, the open source project, it being open source, this was a contribution not from the author but from the crowd. It was uh, to adapt the project so that the software works with these off-the-shelf boards, they're only 20 bucks, and everything comes connected, pre-wired, ready to go, you just connect the motors, pop in the modules, good to go. It has some features that aren't needed, but most of the features are already there. So it saves a ton of time and a ton of complexity and really reduces the chances of making a mistake. Uh, I would highly recommend doing it this way instead of this way. <laughs> if only I had known. So after the electronics were sorted and sort of validated that it was all working, the, um, the software looks like it could be daunting, but they, they've really boiled it down to sort of the bare minimum essentials. Uh, they have online configurators where you don't have to know how to code and how to change what variable into this or that or why to do this. You just punch in the details of your mount, your gear ratios, the number of steps in your motors, uh, whether it's equatorial, whether it's a fork mount, whether it's alt as, that sort of information. And it just spits up a configuration file that you use to sort of load the brain. So it's pretty, pretty easy. So at this point, I had everything sort of proof of concept done. I had the mount mechanics, the electronics and the software all ready to go and working. And this was around November last year. I had my first flight with this. And uh, I was able to shoot Orion with the, the little high sensitivity CMOS cameras that I was talking about last year. So I was super ecstatic for this. Because previously, I was doing stationary. Very short exposure, very short focal length. You know, the entire Orion Nebula would just be a smudge this big in the picture. So to be able to finally get image scale and see these things up close and in detail is fantastic. So I used it in that sort of configuration for probably half a year, many months, sort of. It's kind of a theme in my projects. Once I get to a working state, progress kind of halts as I start using it and having fun. But recently, I finally decided to uh, finish it by ruggedizing the electronics. So I designed a 3D printed enclosure that fits my perf board circuit, and I uh, bought some nice locking strain relieved connectors and uh, high quality cables that are sort of cold resistant, they don't get so stiff. So I, I was able to sort of ruggedize it so it's fit for field work without having to worry about my Tupperware cracking it out. <laughs> and uh, at that point it was done, and uh, been working really great. And what I primarily use it for is sort of remote observing. So I have it connected with Bluetooth to a little Windows 10 computer, and the Windows 10 computer is driving the two cameras, and it's connected to this tiny little Wi-Fi router that's creating its own network for the mount control computer. And that allows me to sort of wirelessly connect a remote desktop into it using a tablet, and I can walk around. I can walk beside the, you know, I, during alignment, I can have my tablet in my hand and be looking through the red dot, adjusting it and getting it all lined up. And once it's ready to go, initialize, I can walk right upstairs to my desktop and then log in remote desktop from there. It's a very seamless transition. It's, it's a lot of fun. So the, the, connect, the connectivity of the OnStep's great. We have all these options of Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, USB, Ethernet. Uh, 
ASCOM drivers, so it's easy to integrate with all your software. Um, Corey, did you, did you 3D print that Jello box? No, that's my uh, my rainproof do here. <laughs> I needed it really bad one night, and it worked. And like I said, it worked, and I haven't improved it since. <laughs> But uh, another cheap module, you can get these pulse width modulation drivers off eBay for like $3 a piece. You just put 12 volts into it, and a knob will vary it from 100% to 0%. And you just run that to some resistors, and it's a dew heater done for like $3. It's insane. Uh, so after having it working, I've been having a lot of fun with it. So here's some examples of stuff. Just last week, I took these. This is my first time being able to image sort of the summer nebula. This detail, so I'm loving it. I'm the ball. Even though you know it's it's an F4 Newtonian, and I have tons of coma, but it's still really fun. And the exposures are always eight seconds. They're really short. It's very forgiving for the mount. It's an eagle. Some galaxies. Twenty inch range. And you can see this amp flow, and I've got gradients. Stuff to improve, but I'm still having a class. And, uh, I've got a future project lined up. I've got a 10 inch Dobsonian that I really want to try and convert to alt azimuth and do some fulgur reduction and try and do short exposure work. And I've got a pipe dream project on the horizon. Just a big giant split ring, but it's many years away, and I've got to find a cheap mirror. You'd be able to make one. Yeah, I'd love to. We've got to find cheap class. It's like a thousand dollars for just a blank or anything. But that's that's all I had. Uh, I brought them out with me. So after the meeting, if you want to poke and prod or ask questions, it'd be great. Are there any questions about anything you saw up there? If anyone's interested in doing it or converting an old mount, I'd be glad to help. It's uh, after having gone through the whole process once, it'd definitely be easier to do it again. Uh, there's a website uh, that lists all the projects that people have completed so you can look through and see if your mount has already been done and a lot of times people will just publish the files for the 3D printed brackets like uh, my files are on Thingiverse and if anyone who has a Vixen Super Polaris can just download it and print it they don't have to design it just clap together it should work so, so, so not a question but a comment I think, Corey, you did some live uh, observing yeah. online through uh, so, YouTube, right? Yep. So it was with this setup. Once I have it set up and running, I switch from my tablet to my desktop, which has a, a nice uh, Ethernet cable, high bandwidth. And I have a program called Open Broadcast System which lets you stream your desktop to a streaming service like YouTube Live or Facebook Live. So I can just instantaneously live broadcast exactly what I'm doing with the microphone for narration and sort of do a worldwide start party or you know talk about something. I, I still have a lot to learn and my commentary is not very interesting, but I think it's a great opportunity. <laughs> you know, what we could, you could do you know, today we're going to follow the evolution of a star and start out with the dark nebula, molecular cloud, and then go to a reflection nebula, and then an emission nebula, and then an open cluster, and find some supernova, some supernova remnant. We have like a big commentary and just broadcast it to a worldwide audience or a Facebook presence. It could be fun to experiment with. Uh, I've watched I've watched you for it twice, oh, and it's it's pretty amazing. The software is uh, just your high speed stacking software. The pictures just fade in in seconds. Yeah, it's and but then he like sits on it for a full three minutes and just keeps getting better and better. I, I love that style, the live stack. It's very engaging and involved, and you can sort of see it develop right in front of you. It's a good time. And there's usually only like five people, so you can ask a question and he answers it. It's a good time. I, I have fun with it. There was one point where he was doing a live stack, and I was like, oh my god. Mario's going to freak out when he sees this. And I think you did make a comment, Mario, you did about one of the pictures of before that. Pretty amazing. Yeah. Really. Very so long. I'm spending all the time building the 32. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did the, I did the math, and 
one hour of Mario's time on his telescope would require, I think, 28 hours on this little thing. Just the, the quality and the final noise in the picture. So it's, it's nice immediate results, but the end product, you can't cheat physics. <laughs> How would we like tune into your live stream? Um, usually, if I plan to, to run the live stream, I'll send a email on Discuss and a link to the YouTube. Um, eventually, maybe we could work with Chris. Maybe we could host it on the Atmobs website and sort of possible. do some publicity through Facebook and send out just big public links and see if anyone's interested. And he's published his old his old streams, so you could just go there and watch it forever at double speed. If so I can watch it. <laughs> <laughs> he's talking too slow. <laughs> Do I really sound like that? <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? That's it? Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Oh yeah, if anyone's interested, I have the ancient control system for the Vixen, so if anyone has an ancient Vixen uh, sky sensor and needs a replacement motor. <laughs> You didn't sell that very well. No. <laughs> Maybe it were 1981. That one's still itself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Why don't you do your own inter introduction? Uh, okay, I'm George Roberts. Uh, I've been a member of the team of these for uh, decades. I'm going to just pass these around. They're all identical. These are bath and ferrometers without the optics, so you don't have to worry about getting the optics greasy. Since I removed them all. Uh, my wife's like, oh, you've got little uh, little sample uh, models of the bath. I'm like, no, no, that's the bath. It's really little. There's one up here that's just this little black portion. This is uh, belongs to Paul's. Oh. Um, I'm going to talk about bath interferometers. Um, I'm going to talk about the cost, the accuracy. Um, I'm going to compare them with Google and Rocky a little bit. Um, I'm going to explain very briefly how it works. I'm going to talk about uh, mirror size limits. You can't test any mirror with them, but probably 99%, probably all mirrors that you guys have, you should go to test. Um, I'm going to give you a quick demonstration of this uh, software that you need to use to analyze the interferograms get from this. And then several times I'm going to refer to my website. I don't know if anybody's interested in bath and from it, but if you are, just grab this card. It's all it has on this card is my website, gr5.org slash bath. And everything you need to know is on there. I've got videos of setting up the bath. I've got videos on using the software. Uh, I spent like a hundred hours working on that video. So it's, I speak more slowly. I speak more clearly in the video. Um, I practiced many times. Um, it's, it's, the video is better than the real thing. Why don't we just put the video on? Yeah, <laughs> the video is 20 minutes and it only covers. Yeah, so this is just a very quick overview. Also, I'm going to give this same talk at um, Cellophane, uh, if anybody's going. And you'll get the longer version, the hour version. This is the 20 minute version. Um, so. It doesn't cost much. These are the price of the optical components that you need. Um, these two components you can get on uh, surplus shed. Excellent. You don't need super good quality here. Uh, this is where you want the extra good quality. Instead of getting a $3 one, you want to get a good $22 one. Again, on my website, I have uh, advice about where to get all these parts, links where you can buy them. Just click on the links and you can order the stuff. <coughs> George, you're going to tell us what a bath can perform. Oh, what does it do? Yeah. It tests telescope. He knows the answer. He's a good straight man. But, but they I test telescope. How, but I want to know how. What it does. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to talk. I'm going to show how it works a little bit. But it's very similar to the Foucault test tester or the Ronke tester. It's, it's more accurate. Um, in addition to the optical parts, you need mechanical parts. Um, the thing I'm passing around, you can. You can order, um, but you could always build it out of wood. This isn't a great design because you can't move the laser. Um, you can't move this lens, and you don't really want to use a half ball lens. You want to use a biconvex lens. Um, 
or you can, this is the one that's being passed around. Um, or you can get the kit for $30. I've got a link on my website. Um, this, this is just great. You can move this, this mirror real easily. You can move the, the lens up, down, left, right. You can move the laser left, right, up, down. And you can rotate the splitter. You don't really want the splitter perfectly orthogonal. You want it like a couple degrees off. Um, and then you're also going to need an XYZ stage. If you want to build this yourself out of wood, this is a great thing to build yourself. It's hard to screw up. Um, or you can just order the kit for $40. Um, it only shows the, it only shows the, um, yeah. it only shows the Z screw, the, up and, uh, the Y screw, the up and down one, but there's also a, a Z screw through the green part and then through this orange part is a next screw. X, Y, and then Z is the optical axis. Um, I know I'm going really quick, but I've timed this, and it takes takes, um, takes 13 minutes to do the slides and three minutes to do the uh, the demonstration of software. So feel free to ask questions. Though. Um, so so far, all the parts I've talked about would cost $123. Um, you also need um, a mirror stand. You can't just put your mirror on a table. You need to hold it properly. You also need at least two tripods, um, one for the, at least I recommend two tripods, one for the bath and the XYZ. This is the XYZ stage right here. This is not mine, this is Paul Borelli's. Yeah. Um, and then a second tripod for the camera. Um, you would also need a test tunnel, I recommend, because of the air currents, because it's so sensitive, it's just a little bit of air currents. But I don't use a test tunnel, I use a box fan, just a window fan, $20 fan from Walmart or whatever, to circulate the air. Um, and I just take a lot of pictures and average them. So you need to circulate the air, otherwise you get air stratification and it causes astigmatism. It's something that's harder to see in the Ronkin Foucault test, but with the bath you get you realize that you have this huge amount of astigmatism because there's cooler air down here and warmer air up here, and just a tenth of a degree Fahrenheit enough to uh, add too much astigmatism. Um, and you need a camera, a nice DSL camera with a view uh, on the back. And um, my camera that I use, you can buy used for $200 now. Um, you can get a 50 millimeter lens for about $50. You want to get an F2, you don't want like an F5 lens, mm -hmm. or F4 lens, you want and preferably not zoom because there's going to be more reflections in the optics. Um, I use an 85 millimeter f1.8. It's an expensive lens. It cost me three hundred dollars, but I already owned it for something else. How many megapixels? How many what? Pixels. How many megapixels? Uh, you don't need a lot. Uh, it depends how big it is in your field of view. You typically want a good thousand or so pixels across. Um, the mirror, which is not a lot of megapixels. You want live view on this camera? You definitely want live view. Live view is really important. Save you a ton of time. <coughs> and people have done this with, with cell phones, but <laughs> it's a nightmare. You, you want manual control. You need to be able to open the f-stop all the way, 100% all the way. You need to be able to adjust the shutter and things like that. Um, so how accurate is it? So there is a mirror that's been sent around the US, and right now it's in Europe. Um, and a lot of people tested this mirror, including me, and including this exact Zygo. Um, this is a, a PSI Zygo. They're very expensive, over $50,000. Um, so that Zygo created this image, the one that's a Zygo in letters too small for you guys to read. Um, so the guy did it with 250 measurements, and then he rotated the mirror 90 degrees to another 250 measurements, so two rotations. And then he averaged the first 250 and got what the wave front looks like. And he averaged the second 250, and then he back rotated it and averaged them together. And that's how you want to do it with the bath. That's how you want to do it with the zygo. And that removes astigmatism from the, air, the last bit of air, it, unless you have a vacuum, which would be nice. But it's too much trouble, I think, for us. Um, that's kind of how I did it, that's how Dale did it. So there's a guy, Dale Eason, he's the one who designed all this stuff. And by the way, if you have a 3D printer, like Corey, um, all these parts are on my website, 
and you can download them and print them on your own 3D printer and save some money. Um, so Dale designed this stuff. He designed the bath, he designed the XYZ stage, and he did. He also wrote the software that I'm going to show you in a few minutes. Um, so he did 100 measurements at eight different mirror rotations. I did 28 measurements, seven each at four different rotations. I, did, I marked the top of the mirror, and I, wrote, I took seven measurements. I rotated 45, 90, 135. Um, so the one on the left is um, done by the $50,000 IGO. The one on the right is done by the $100 um, interferom or bath interferom or Dale Eason Holmes. And you can see they look very similar. The, the red areas are high by about 0.04 waves. So the pink there is about 0.04 waves high. And this is wavefront error, not surface error. Wavefront error is double surface. So the surface is even twice as good as this. And then this blue area is about um, 20th wave low. So that's about a 20th wave high. That's about a 20th wave low. So peak to peak would be a 10th wave in the wave front. Actual mirror peak to peak would be a 20th wave because the actual, the actual surface is half the wave front mirror. Um, so they agreed. Uh, it's just amazing how much my quick test I did in 14 minutes agreed with, with these guys. Um, for example, if you look at the second spherical, which, is, which causes this ring in this valley out here, um, that's the second, not the first spherical aberration, the second spherical aberration. Um, Dale measured 0.02 waves, so it's a 50th of a wave of error. I measured 0.019. And the zygote measure 0.019. So we agree within a thousandth of a wavelength of light of what the second spherical is. We also agree, these are the three biggest errors on this second spherical, spherical aberration, and the uh, astigmatism are the three biggest sources of error on this mirror. And uh, we agree within uh, pretty tight tolerance. It's pretty amazing. So, so a bath, a cheap $100 bath, is as good as a 50,000 zygote, except the zygote's faster. It took this guy like two minutes, and it took us um, over an hour to analyze all the pictures. So, do you want to save time? <laughs> yeah, did you want to say something? Yeah, George, as you know, we're going to uh, try and tackle that this coming year at the clubhouse. I'd like to. Yeah, we have a clean room now for grinding and polishing. We have a mirrormatic machine and a spin grinder. Um, so, we also have a test on it. My question is twofold, actually. How large a mirror can we test with this setup? And focal, like a like a focal test, do you need to do? Does it? It needs to go at the exact twice? exact same spot as the Foucault. So exact same spot. Yeah, twice yeah. the twice the focal length. Okay, so we're limited to about a six foot focal length telescope of any aperture, whether that's a twelve inch f six. If you use the clubhouse one, yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, we have about uh, twelve feet in our test tunnel, I believe. Okay. But you say that you set it up yourself without a tunnel, you just use the fan. Yep. But the, and you got results comparable to the Yeah, this was with the fan. With the bath and the kitchen and the mirror against the uh, You want to set it up on a concrete floor. Um, if you put it on a wood floor and you walk around, it all of a sudden it changes when you take a step. It's very annoying. Um, it's it's going to save you a ton of time to put it on a concrete floor. But um, yeah, I did it in my basement, which is the as far as air stratification, it's the worst room in the house because the floor is cool and the ceiling is warm. Um, when I did these measurements, it was um, getting it was getting close to summer. It was like uh, April or May, and it was pretty hot outside that day. Um, and so I really had to leave the fan running for a good 20 minutes. Cause you wouldn't, when you're first figuring the mirror and you're just doing rough, you don't need to do 28 measurements. You can just do one or two. But when you're getting to the final most accurate stuff. You need to sure. let the fan run for a while. You need the mirror itself to cool for a couple hours. So what's the process? You set the, you set. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. Um, but mostly you have to watch my video. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, we don't have time today to show the setup. I'd love to show you at the clubhouse. I don't like the drive to the clubhouse because it takes me two hours round trip. Um, but if somebody, you know, if somebody's motivated and, and gets me up there, I'd love to help set it up and demonstrate it. Um, I'm going to be at Stellafane. I'll, I can show you at Stellafane exactly what you do. Lots of time at Stellafane. I don't want to show you yet. 
Um, I'm going to go over this really quick. I just wanted to show you. I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to say that Rocky and Fuki are horrible. You can Fuko are horrible. They're they're great. Lots of people make great mirrors, but. Do you guys see that that black line in the middle has a little bit of an S shape? This, mm -hmm. this image came from Cloudy Nights just this week. And that mirror I know has 0.6 waves of astigmatism, which is huge. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty bad mirror. It's, it's still early on in the fingering process. Yet, you can just barely see it. So I, I'm told that, that astigmatism, is, astigmatism is one of the Achilles heels of the Foucault and the Rocky. Um, but, George, tell us what a common path interferometer is. A common path? What sort of, it's a Versus path. the right angle? No, just common path. the common path in terms of cancellation of aberration. Okay, so, um, so this is kind of how it works, sort of. Um, so laser light's coming up here, it goes off the splitter and gets split into two paths. The blue color is representing the, it's a red light laser. So the blue, the blue lines are still red light laser. It's just, I use blue to help separate the two beams. The red beam is usually called the test beam, the blue beam is usually called the reference beam. But let me start over. So here's the laser beam, comes up, half of it goes off the splitter here, goes through the lens, um, it gets focused to this point. So if you've got using say a 10 millimeter lens, this would be 10 millimeters from the center of the lens. Then it diverges out and comes out to the mirror, which would be you know, six feet or so this way. And then the light comes back, the red light comes back. Um, so the, the lens, the, the mirror, the telescope mirror, is roughly a sphere. And this wave front is spherical. It goes out, hits that sphere, comes back, bounces off this mirror, comes to the focus point here, and then it diverges out here, bounces off the back of the splitter, onto your sheet of paper or you can put a camera there. The light also goes through the splitter, so equal light goes both ways. And the blue lines represent the light that goes through the splitter, it goes off this mirror. Th this diameter is about one millimeter for a typical laser, so it's a little bit exaggerated, but anyway, that's the laser beam. It goes off the mirror anywhere, the center of the mirror is typical. It comes back, it's blue light, it comes through the diverging lens, focuses, same distance as this did, and then it goes out. And if you have it in the right position and focus, just like a Foucault, you have to get it in focus. Um, the two images, um, what's the word? They interfere. And you get interfere in there. And what um, Paul is referring to is this can be a pretty crappy lens because if it's got some spherical aberration, if it's not a perfect lens, because the beams both go through the same lens, the reference and the test beam, it cancels out for the most part. Um, it's best not to use a plano convex, it's best to use a bi, bi convex lens, meaning it's, it's got a curvature on both sides to it. I talk about that on my website, I talk about which lenses to get. Edmund Scientific has, has a bunch, I have a couple links to different people who sell lenses. They're cheap, about $22. Um, I bought a $3 lens from Circular Shed and it works pretty darn good, but it's not as good as my $22 lens. Um, if you test a perfectly spherical mirror, which we usually do parabolic mirrors, you will get, and everything's at focus, you will get either all red or all black interferogen. But if it's got a little tilt to it, you'll get a pattern. This is an example of a perfect spherical mirror tilted where the right side is five waves closer to us and the left side's five waves further. So there's 10 fringes across it. So that's the tilt. And this is what a uh, parabolic mirror would look like if the right side was also five waves closer to you. When you set this up, it's not, once you get it roughly near focus, it's not that confusing what to do. You just turn the three knobs on this and you look what happens and you start to realize everybody just naturally goes to focus. It's just like, it's like it draws you there, like a, like a beautiful scene. You just walk towards it and just, you turn it one way, it looks worse, you turn it the other way, it looks better, and you find focus. Why do you, why do you tilt the mirror five ways again? Uh, I just gave you, this is just an example. Um, it's recommended to do about this many waves, about 20 or 30 or 40 so that waves of tilt. More? So this is a real mirror, this is a real in a fairgram. Um, you can kind of see my, uh, this curvature here is my camera lens 
f-stop, big netting a little bit, and then this is the Mariner test. You can see there's a lot of noise in this. There's some noise here, which does mess up things slightly, but the, the, the software is amazing. The DFT frame software can handle a lot of noise and it still works fine. Um, what's, yeah, that's, there's Mario's mirror. Is that a wrong key or is that a laser? That's a laser test. Yeah. He's got a little noise in there. It doesn't matter. The software is amazing. It can take an, an diagram like this, an NFAIRgram, and you can have photos with it. <laughs> Mario's good. <laughs> um, there's a question about size limit. Um, so the bath, a cheap bath like mine, can only test mirrors above this red line. So for example, a 20 inch mirror, um, you can test to like f2.9, definitely test an f4, f5, f6, it gets easier and easier the higher up you go. This is true with Foucault testing and Monkey Mon sure. testing too. Um, but the bath can go about to the red line, it's not a hard and fast limit, but um, so I was, I asked Mara, he's got a 32 inch F6. So if it was parabolic, you could test it. It's well above the red line. Although his is spherical, so it's even easier to test than the bath. Anybody looking at their mirror, if you had a 10 inch, you can go down about F2 and a half. If you have a 20 inch, you can go down, well, I did that one. So if you had a mirror that was on the red line, the diagram would look like this. Um, this is why it's difficult. I wanted to show you why it's difficult. The, the fringes get so close together, it gets really difficult. And um, you might actually have to switch. If you're going to go below that, you might have to switch to a more expensive laser, not a $2 laser, but one that actually um, has more coherence. So these fringes get so close together, at some point you can't, you can't test them there anymore. I don't know what you're doing. OK. That was the supposed to be 13 minutes part, and now I'm going to show you the, video, show you the actual software. So this is the DFT fringe software. I'm going to demonstrate it here. I'm going to open up a real fringe that I took, the uh, interferogram that I took. And I'm going to go through this really quick. I have a nice long video that explains this better, because it's probably easier to see in the dark. So the first thing you do after you load it is you, you click on the left side of the mirror. And again, I have a video that I worked really hard on that explains this much more clear than this. Um, I'm going to zoom in, and it's showing us the, the right, left, top, and bottom of the mirror. And then I have done this so many hundreds of times um, that I can do it. And um, wow, that's, wow. It's hard to see that. OK. Um, so after you do this a few hundred times, it does not take very long. It takes a few seconds. OK, and you click Done. So basically, I've told it where the edge of the mirror is. Then you just you click here, and you drag the blue circle so it touches the white circle. Um, I'm not going to explain that because it's not. Oh, just that it's a Fourier transform. Yeah, it's a Fourier transform. It's magic. Um, <laughs> I explain it more in my videos in more detail when we have more time. And so here it is. This is the mirror. This is just one interferogram. And you still get great results with just one interferogram. You don't really have to do 30, 30 or so. So this point 125 here, that's an eighth of a wavelength. So this is showing you plus and minus one eighth wave of wavefront error. Um, so peak to valley. valley. It's, it's one sixteenth of a wave of surface error. And so you can see this mirror has this ring here. Um, let me go back to this split I was on before. And I'll just show you some a real quick thing. Um, it's got a strail value of 0.82, which means it reflects 82% of the light from a star would go into the airy disk. Um, a strail value of 1 would be a perfect mirror. Um, it's got the RMS error here is 0.07 waves of light, um, which is pretty good. It's OK. And if you look in this RMS column here, the biggest contributor, it's right there. You get 60 of that is from the second spherical, which is, which is this, um, this ring here in that value. Um, 
that's it. That's all I was going to show for now. So what you do with that information, I mean, is that merit worthy or is it work? Um, I mean, how do you know? Well, I mean, you can look, you can click on the next thing here, star test. I don't know what's a good mirror. Yeah. Do you guys know how what your strail is for any of your mirrors? I, I would try to do better. Um, it would be tough. You, I would at least try to polish up this middle ring here. Um, other than that, you might have to just start over, uh, go back to making the sphere. Not completely over, but go back to making the sphere again. Yeah, I mean, the light. Well, you must have a quarter way to speak the valley and the wave front, no matter what other optics are in the beams. And that you would normally test with a star test. The whole idea here is you get out from having to be in outdoors with a tracking telescope and all kinds of seeing problems, bringing it into the laboratory where you have controlled conditions, and then you go after this. The strail value, I strongly disregard uh, because it's supposed to take into account the scatter effects due to very high frequency zones like orange peel on the surface. And it doesn't measure that very well. So uh, I, I, an old timer, I go by peak to valley and have to add the peak to valleys from each of the optical components. No, <coughs> no Newtonian, you have a paraboloid and a fold mirror, that's it. But each of those must be good enough to not exceed the half the core wave. Otherwise you fail the Rayleigh criteria. So I, I skipped over a couple things. Um, if you were making a mirror and you were parabolizing it, this is try I'm gonna try to answer Bruce's question. If you're parabolizing it, um, you can I, I, I didn't mention that you put in the mirror parameters in the configuration here. And then what you do is you try to get this to negative one. So you want to um, parabolize it maybe halfway and then put it on the put it on the stand and test it and see if you're indeed at minus 0.5, which would be halfway parabolized from sphere. And that's how a lot of people use it. They just keep parabolizing it until they get to minus one, and, and then they're done. But this is actually telling you this thing that looks like a potato chip. It's actually telling you that's a high one. It's telling you it's a high ring here. Right. That's that's the biggest source of error. But it's only like a sixteenth of a wave. Yes. Right. So you could design a special um, tool yeah. that ground out more than that area than the other areas. Yeah. Oh, polish down. What? You talking about polishing it out? Yeah, you could polish yeah. out that ring, and you might want to polish out the edge a little, but I, <laughs> I don't know if I would. I would. <laughs> I would probably just try to go for that ring, or I would start over. I don't think I was. I'm not a mirror maker, so I don't know. I read cloudy nights. So. <laughs> one way of lens with green light. From an armchair mirror maker. One way of lens with green light represents 22 millionths of an inch. That gives you a conversion from wavefront error to surface error. And uh, what good is knowing that you're within a millionth of an inch if you can't prove it? <laughs> but. This, the test can do it. Yeah, this can prove it. And you can you can grind down, I shouldn't say grind down, I should polish. You can polish this out for a certain amount of time and then retest it and see if you're making it better or worse. What? Yeah, not much time. Right? Not much time. Is you wind up testing something yeah. else up. So, yeah. so you, yeah, yeah. So you might have a plan and think, oh, uh, uh, with experience, I know how long to polish this out, and then you just do half of it and see what happens. <clears throat> Yeah, it's, the, the it's a tiny amount of error. Is a topographic map, and the profiles are shown on the left and back yeah. um, of what the, the zones are. Mm -hmm. So you can also get um, diameters of the slices. Oh, sure. There's all kinds of features I haven't shown you, because I don't have much time. Is the so, what does the software cost? Oh, it's free. Oh, it's, oh, everything's it's free. free. Everything's open source. The software is open cool. source. It only works on the PC, though. So I had to bring a PC. Um, yeah, the, the, the designs for the bath are open source. It's, and there's nice software for raunchy tests, too. You can take a picture of it. And the software for is that an age, That is a six. 
six, and I'd use a four inch sub diameter tool. <laughs> That's what Mario would do. That's what I would do. And also, you probably don't care about the very center if it's a Newtonian. So, yeah. I've seen these cool tools where you, you, you do a special shape. Oh, yeah. To, per, to parabola. Yeah, we had trouble with those really easy. Yeah. I, I, I'm not a grinder. Sort of, it's, a, it's, it's not like it's a potato chip. No, it's not a stigmatism. It's not a potato chip. This yeah. mirror is pretty good with the stigmatism. I did it to a four inch tool. Yeah, yeah. The 24 inch telescope at the uh, Wallace Observatory was found after many years of use to have a tenth wave of astigmatism because it was only tested with a, a Foucault test. We didn't have interferometers when that was built. And uh, MIT contracted with uh, Taurus Optics out of the Midwest. They set it up on an interferometer saw the two high points that corresponded to the astigmatism, made up pitch laps, and 10 minutes later, it was better than a 20 foot away. Nice. With a little bit of polishing. Does that answer your question, Bruce? What would you do with this? Are you area? Do you polish it a little bit more? Try to get a little bit better. <clears throat> and if you screw it up, you start over. I was at that. I don't know if they still have it, but on the way down to the Winter Star Party one year, I stopped in somewhere near Cape Canaveral, and there's a guy, uh, I forget his name, but uh, he was part of the One Meter Telescope Initiative. David Argento? Yeah, exactly. And uh, they, he had for a few years, he called it the Florida Fringe Festival because it's looking at fringes. Oh, yeah. I had one of my mirrors tested there and wound up throwing the mirror away afterwards because it, <laughs> <laughs> it Paul, Paul can laugh, but I think it was one of the mirrors that I actually bought from Paul. <laughs> oh, that was one of John it Martin's had, it had a it had junk a, pieces. It had a fold in the lab, it wasn't properly nailed. Anyways, um, I had exposure to this before, but the 12 years or so since I went to the Fringe Festival, it looks like the technology. Things have gotten better. Yeah, Things especially the fact that those days you didn't print. Uh, your, your parameter part. There was a time when you when you had to like click the mouse on the fringe lines. Yeah. Right. Yep. Now yep. it's. I remember just, that. Uh, now it uses for your transforms. I, I'm wondering if, if it, it may be the same program or it might have been a different. One. It's been evolving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it was called something else. Open fringe. Open fringe. Exactly. Yeah. Same same evolution. Same thing. Uh, so, so open fringe is by you know person A and then Dale E. Simmons. Wrote DMC French and he, he took most of the codes of program. Like five. Yeah. Also on here, I have a link to, to the download for, for Open French. I mean, for DMT French. All right, you have one more speaker, right? If you come to Stella Fane, um, I can, I'll, I'll actually have one set up. We can see the fringes live. I can show, show you how, how you set it up. So I might say that, um, as, as Richard mentioned, we've been working on, and Steve mentioned, working on the mirror grinding instruments. Uh, Bur um, Barry is back, and he replaced the motor controller I fried a couple of work a work party ago, and, and it's up and running. So, um, uh, so we're really moving forward. A couple more things to do. We'll be able to hog out glass and make some big mirrors, so, or fix some old bad mirrors. Maybe. It helps to be a, a trail walker or a mountain climber to read topographic map, maps. And once you can do that, uh, it makes things very easy. Or you can just use the software. <laughs> yes, right. 
polish the highs on the void below. <laughs> Okay, so Rich Nugent is up next, and he's got an amateur astronomer for over 50 years, and he's a member of Atmom now uh, since 1992. I think I was 1993. I didn't so. think you were that old. I didn't think I was either. <laughs> I, joined, I joined the night that um, the membership elected Johnny Carson as an honorary member of the club. That's all I knew I was old. So I found, I found my, my people. Um, but yeah, retired in 2016. I spent all my time now with grandkids and then observing. And so uh, um, I consider myself to be um, really just a visual observer. I'll, I'll stick an iPhone in front of the, the eyepiece every now and again just, to, just because you can. Um, I'm giving a talk uh, at the conjunction this year on lunar observing, revisiting an old friend. Now, this is a non judgmental presentation, okay, Mario? Yeah. All right? Because <laughs> I, I know there are some people in the room that really, really don't like the moon. <laughs> really don't like it. And I get it. I get it. And you know, people ask me, what do you like to observe? You know, some folks, like Glenn Chapman is another star guy, a variable star guy. Some people like planets, some people like deep sky imagers. I kind of like to look at all kinds of different stuff. If it's daytime, I look at daytime stuff. If it's nighttime, I look at nighttime stuff. If the moon is in the sky, I look at the moon. You know, that sort of thing. And so I'm not going to judge and Please don't judge me back. But you know, I, I, I start to think about giving this sort of a presentation when I start to get nostalgic. One of the things I find is I'm getting older. I'm getting very nostalgic. And I think back to when I first started doing astronomy. I had, my very first telescope was a Sears Discovery a Discovery Telescope. My folks managed to somehow scrape up the money. It's about a hundred bucks back in I think it was around January, either late December of '66 or January of '67. I got it, and I almost will, I don't I didn't never took notes back in those days, but I'm pretty sure the first thing I looked at was the moon. And I'll bet you all of you, the first thing you looked at through your telescope, I don't care what age you were or are was probably the moon. I looked at the neighbor's window. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, but you know, that's a different talk. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> really But even Galileo, when Galileo built his telescope in late 1609, one of the first things he looked at was the moon. And I'm pretty sure he was amazed by it, as we all were when we first looked at the moon. So there's no reason to abandon the moon. It's in the sky half the time you want, you want it to be out of the sky. But anyway, that's what I talk is about. So why is the moon good for us? Well, first of all, it, it, it is a primary cause for the tides on Earth. Um, that's, these are, that's a picture from the, of the Bay of Fundy. It stabilizes the obliquity of the Earth, that 23 and a half degree tilt. Um, and also it provides, and not so much anymore, well, it still provides light, but we don't use it so much anymore. I do all of my harvesting up at Stop and Shop. Yeah. So I don't need the moon to be in the sky to help me. But um, back in the day, farmers welcomed the harvest moon in September to add light to the night. So actually, if it wasn't for the moon, we could be looking at the southern hemisphere. Wait, say that again? If it wasn't for the moon, we could be We'd have a much better view of things. That's right. The sky there is much better, right? <laughs> anyway, we, we have to deal with what we've got. So why do we observe the moon? Well, it's big. It's 2,159 miles in diameter. It's close. Um, it's, it orbits in an elliptical orbit, 225 to 252-ish, average about 239, 239,000 miles, a quarter of a million miles. That's a nice, easy way to say it. Its surface features are easily visible, and its past history has been preserved. The uh, moon is an airless, waterless world where there is little um, erosion taking place. The, the, the erosion that takes place on the moon is caused by micrometeoroids. Um, sort of sandblasting the surface over eons of time. So the footprints that Neil and Buzz laid on the moon 50 years ago this month um, are expected to be there as crisp and sharp as they are today in a million years. They're, they're going to still be there preserved. I, I envision a Until they get stepped on. Well, I envision a nice museum can. I, I think they should build a, a glass floored museum over that so that we can all go there and see it someday. If Elon Musk has his way, well, anyway, the moon undergoes space, and I get it. The imagers um, don't like the moon from about here to about here. here. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. I get that. But well, we can look at the changing face of the moon. You guys all know this stuff already. Um, new moon comes along about once a month, um, and the best part of new moon is it offers us an occasional uh, eclipse. 
um, the um, moon's orbit is tilted about just a little bit more than five degrees relative to the ecliptic. So in order for an eclipse to take place, new moon has to occur at one of the nodes in the orbit here. Um, same thing with lunar eclipses at, at full moon. They have to occur at very specific points along the orbit. That's why we don't get them all the time. As I said, the moon is in an elliptical orbit. Sometimes it's further away, and you get annular eclipses, that ring of fire eclipse, where the moon's apparent diameter isn't sufficiently large enough to cover the apparent diameter of the sun. However, the, we have totality in the sun. Uh, Kelly's here. He was in, he was in Chile last week. Um, for the, this is the 2017 eclipse from Columbia, uh, from Marion, Illinois, on the Atmog trip. But, um, but that's, that's what's cool about new moon. Um, Earth shine is another thing to look for. I, mean, I don't know, I know you've all seen it, but have you ever really looked at it through your telescope? Earth shine, the phenomenon, was correctly explained by Leonardo da Vinci um, about 500 years ago. Turns out what it is, is it's sunlight striking the Earth, clouds, surface, reflect some of that light into space, intercepted by the moon and reflected back to the Earth. We see Earth shine best when there's a crescent moon in the sky. The phases of the Earth and the moon are opposite. If you look at the moon as a nice thin crescent in the evening sky here, and transport yourself right, right to the moon, and look back at the Earth, what you see is the opposite phase. So when we see a, a, a slender crescent here, a lunar observer would be seeing a nearly full Earth. And so the Earth reflects quite a bit of light into space, which is why Earth shines brightest when you have a nice thin crescent moon. This was taken by um, Karen Prell of uh, the skyscrapers. She posted it up on Facebook last week, and I thought, oh, Karen, can I use your picture? Sure. And you can see nice features on the surface of the moon. And if you look at the moon, um, while there's plenty of Earth shine, you can see quite a bit of the, of the lunar features under uh, that nighttime glow. It's actually kind of fun to do. That you can actually see that stuff in the nighttime side of the moon. And what's good about Earth shine? Well, it makes it easy to look at occultations. I don't know. If, I don't know how experienced all of us are. Some are way more experienced than others. If 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 you've never seen an occultation of a star by the moon, it's really something cool to watch. Since the moon has virtually no atmosphere, and the star is, for all intended purposes, infinitely far away. The star is represented by a nearly infinitely small point of light. The reality of it, right? And so as the moon's orbital motion carries it from the west to the east, it gets closer and closer to a star it's about to cover up. And because there's no atmosphere to gradually dim the star down, the star is at full brightness until the instant the moon's edge cuts it off. And it's really fun to watch. If you've never seen one, go for it. Now, the occultations of bright stars are relatively rare. So you have to be a little bit more proactive than that. If you've got a telescope with a little bit of aperture, you can go out and look at Earthshine, and you can see fainter stars being occulted. I like to take my telescopes out, and you know, it's rare to see a first magnitude star being occulted by the moon. But seventh magnitude stars disappear behind that edge all the time. And so I like to use high power. If you've got a clock drive, it's even better, because you've got a guide on the star. And watch the moon creep closer and closer and closer. Don't blink, don't blink, don't blink. It's fabulous to watch. Yes, sir? Another occultation that's fun to watch is a grazing model. Oh, sure. So rather than the star just blinking out, it's actually kind of skimming the surface or the edge of the moon. If you and, look at Alan's eclipse pictures, you can see that the limb of the moon, that curved edge of the moon, is not perfectly smooth. Right. It's got mountains and peaks and valleys, and that's what primarily causes Bailey's beads and the diamond ring effect. And you're right, if you've, got a, if you've got a grazing occultation where the north pole of the moon or the south pole of the moon is just scraping by that star, it'll wink on and off, on and off. Now, the graze lines are tight because the mountains of the moon aren't all that high. And that information, that data, was used to profile the moon before we had uh, different, you know, different ways to do it. Sure, sure. Japanese laser surveys. As a matter of fact, I, I don't mention it in here, but now that it's come up, to take your telescope out and look at the limb of the moon against the black of the sky. You'll see that it's not perfectly smooth. It is not. You can see the mountains and peaks in Dallas. It's actually kind of cool. Sometimes planets are occulted um, by the moon. Um, rare, but it does happen. The, the Royal um, Handbook, the Royal Society of the Canada, the handbook that Eileen makes available to us every December, they list occultations all throughout that 
uh, all throughout the year. So they're fun to watch, you should check them out. Um, so, but why do we look at them? Well, we look at the moon because, like I said, it's big and it's close, and I hate that image on there. So, but let's look at this image over here. There are the lunar maria, the lunar seas, um, named as such, as such by Galileo when he first looked at them through his telescope. Now, if we could time transport Galileo to 2019 and have him look through some of our, even the junkiest department store telescopes, they would blow him away. They blow him away. I don't know if you ever looked through a replica of Galileo's telescope, but it's a high power, super narrow field of view. I don't even know how he aimed it. And I know he bought good glass, but I don't know how well corrected his optics were or, or what he really saw. But he didn't see the things we can see. The lunar seas, are, they, to him, they look like bodies of water. They're dark. Uh, they're, they're, to him, they were crater-free, and he presumed that they were bodies of water. Today, we know that they're just lava flows. Most of those uh, regions of the dark maria, which are easily visible with the naked eye, are impact basins that were produced during the era of heavy bombardment, 3.8 to 4 billion years ago. A little later on, they welled up lava from below and filled in that nice flat surface. Since the era of heavy bombardment was over, they are relatively crater-free, younger surfaces than the lunar highlands, which are heavily cratered and battered from an earlier time. The reason they look different is because the rocks are chemically different. The basaltic lava flows are dark, whereas the, the highlands are, are silicates that are light, lighter in color. You can see lots and lots of craters. When you look at the Terminator, this day-night line on the moon, and most of us are probably up in the evening as opposed to the early morning. In, uh, in the, um, the uh, waxing moon, from new moon to full moon, that terminator is the sunrise line on the moon. And because the sun angle is so low, the shadows are, are long, they're stark, uh, there's no softening because of an atmosphere. And craters can be seen with great detail uh, near the terminator. The uh, lunar X is occasionally visible here. It's just a, it's a, it's a clear, obscure. It's a, it's a play of light. It's where uh, four craters converge on each other to produce this X-shaped um, bit of light out here. It lasts for a few hours until the sun angle gets up and those craters start to fill in with light. But it's a fun thing to look at. And Al, do you, you still publish that, right? We're now going. Oh, here's right here yeah. in the newsletter, right? Sometimes you see that yeah, in, yeah. in the newsletter. So it, it happens in a certain hour of the month with the moon, a few hours. And you can go up there and take a look at the lunar X. It's kind of cool. It's very cool. Well, look at all the detail you can see. That's an iPhone. I just held an iPhone up to my telescope. That's <laughs> pretty cool. So again, there are, I mean, the moon is a world. You, it's, it's not just a dot in the sky. It's got mountains and craters and valleys, and they're all visible. These are the Apennine mountain range. That's Archimedes. Uh, the Apollo 15 landing site was over here, right in there. Um, there are, this is the crater Ptolemaeus right here, um, a lava-filled crater that usually shows no detail. If you catch that crater when the sun angle is really low, like right at sunrise or sunset, the detail on the floor, the subtle undulations of the floor really kind of show up because you've got that low sun angle and even the smallest of hills um, will cast a bit of a shadow. Um, um, I think on, not, at least on one of the Apollo landings, they actually got lost a little bit because it was so hard to see the landmarks once the shadows disappeared. And the, these are, the, 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 the surface of the moon is not as stark and as rugged as it looks. Um, things are very smoothed out. and It doesn't take much of a, a, a sun angle uh, to have all your shadows disappear. And I mean, that's what it is. Here, look at this thing right here. That's a fault line of the moon. That's the straight, uh, the straight wall. That's probably about 70 miles across. And it's probably about a, about a thousand feet, top to bottom. And it shows up really well um, at sunrise and at sunset. Very cool. iPhone photos. I wish Glenn were here. Glenn always pipes up the iPhone up to the IVs. That's all these things are. Well, at full moon, even full moon, there's stuff to look at. Um, if you look at the full moon with your naked eye, um, you can see craters. You know, people have asked me, why did they even discover the craters earlier? It's because they're just below the visual power of our eyes, if you will. But at high, under high illumination, you can see craters like Langrenus. That white spot right there is easy to see. Tycho, Copernicus, Kepler, uh, Aristarchus, Kepler's over here. 
aristocrats. You can see those things at, at, uh, at full moon with your naked eye. With a pair of binoculars, the view improves. I like at full moon to look at telescopes. I like to, with my telescopes, I like to look at the lunar highlands and look at the really brilliantly bright craters. Um, the brightest crater on the moon is Aristarchus right there, on the near side at least. And it's, uh, it's a young, relatively young, fresh crater, probably only a few, maybe tens of millions of years old. But that's relatively young, and the, the impact is still bright, uh, bright white from pulverized rock and the composition, and it's just pretty cool to look at. Like that. The ray structures are the splashes produced by these impacts. And you can see Tycho's, probably the most famous ray structure of all, where these rays emanate out from the crater um, in all directions. Pretty cool. There's a splash from Copernicus right there. Pretty neat to look at. Anyway, fun stuff. We also get to look at eclipses at full moon. And uh, you know, once again, occasionally, when the full moon occurs near the node in the orbit of the moon and the Earth, um, we can see partial eclipses. We can see total eclipses. This was from last January, the really cold eclipse in January. I was going to watch that from inside a car. Because I mean, why else would they put a moon roof in a car? <laughs> Do you remember how cold it was? Do you remember how cold that night was? <laughs> Yikes. Well, so and when we go to star parties, we always, we're always asked if we can see the flags on the moon. And um, so there's a shot from Apollo 17 um, with the Earth in the background there. Pretty cool. The Apollo flags are three feet by five feet. And if you do the old Sokotoa, remember that high school trigonometry you thought you'd never ever need again? If you break out the Sokotoa and do the arithmetic, the flags on the moon sub 10, even in the greatest width, uh, uh, 8 million arc seconds on the sky. So that's about a thousand times below the limit of what you can actually see in backyard telescopes, at least a thousand times smaller. And so the answer is just absolutely not. But people like to ask that question all the time, so I thought I would include that just for fun. No, you can't see the flags on the moon, but you can see some pretty big stuff. The Abraham Basin is about 700 miles across. And so what I did was I, I took Google Earth Pro on the desktop, and I used a radius circle to, to produce a circle the same size as, in this case, the Imran Basin. And you can see that that's a fairly good chunk of real estate right there. Um, ground zero for that impact was probably, that would have been a bad day. Thank you, Neil. That would have been a really bad day. Because it, that's a big hole in the ground. Um, but it's pretty good. But, but so what, what can you see? What, how small can you go with your telescope? That's an interesting challenge. And so I put some examples together. There's the great Copernicus crater. It's about 60 miles in diameter. It's sent it on Boston. It's a pretty big piece of ground. You know, that's easy. You can see that in binoculars really easily. If you want to go smaller, it's some of, some of my favorite real estate on the moon. There's the crater Plato. This is right after first quarter. This is Mount Python. And I love it because just to the south of Mount, Py Mount Python, you can see these two little craters. Here they are, right here. That one's four miles across, and that one's three miles across. Now we're getting down to some pretty small stuff, <coughs> all things considered. Now I had my 60 millimeter Unitron out last night, and I could not see. Was it last night? Yeah. I couldn't see those craters. Maybe it was the scene, maybe the fact that I'm using a fairly small telescope. I can see five mile wide craters with a 60 millimeter telescope. So you can see some of these small craters with almost any telescope you own. But there it is. Now here is centered on the center for astrophysics. Right there. And you can see that that three mile wide crater takes up a good chunk of Cambridge. But now we're getting down to city sized landscapes. And sometimes when I'm looking at the moon, and I offer the same thing to you the next time you go out and look at the moon, is to look at some of these small craters. Go grab a diameter off an atlas or something and, and put it into perspective of maybe your hometown. When, I, when we observe from my driveway, I'll tell people, well, we're right here on this edge of the crater, and the Natick Mall is over there. You can walk there. You know, It's kind of fun when you think about how small some of these guys are. In, inside Kissini, there are some two mile wide craters, and it even gets better when you get up to Plato. These Plato craterlets um, are between a half a mile and 1.7 miles. Um, and so, I, for the small guy, here we are at the Center for Astrophysics. There's House of Chang for those that walk there tonight. <laughs> so, you can see that it's like a really small piece of real estate that you can actually see with some of your, with some of your telescopes. So, how do you look for the really fine details if that's what you want to challenge yourself with? You need a low sun angle so, that you can, so the floors of the craters are shattered. You really want a favorable vibration where the moon, the moon actually 
um, rocks back and forth a bit, and because it's angled, you can see top and bottom a little bit. So you want a good libra libration for it, and you want, ideally you want the moon to be a perigee, the closest point in its orbit to the Earth, to give you a fighting chance. Your telescope should probably be a large aperture, the largest one you've got. High magnification, collimate that darn thing, and hope for excellent sync. And if all those pieces of the puzzle come together, you might just start to see some stunning detail on the moon, really tiny stuff. So, you can also look at transits. Uh, this is just something I threw up there because I like it, it's fun to do. Um, about a year and a half ago, Bruce, you, you mentioned this website um, on, in an email, ISS Transit Finder. It auto detects your location from your computer. It predicts um, transits of the sun and the moon uh, for the ISS. And the size of a football field, it's a pretty big target. You can actually see it as it crosses the moon or using safe, you know, solar viewing techniques. Or you can watch it cross the disk of the sun. The transits are fast, don't blink. They're, they're probably not much more than two or three seconds max. Most of them are about a second. Use video less. Less. So ideally, you'd want to set up a camera with a video or uh, an imaging camera that can take very rapid uh, exposures so that you can capture it across there. Uh, but it's fun to do. And, and just in case you were wondering, look at how big it looks. I mean, right? There it is. The, the space station is the size of a football field, 230 nautical miles high. You can see it with your telescopes. I've been given this homework assignment for the better part of a year. Has anybody done it yet? Has anybody done their homework yet? <laughs> Take a telescope outside and look at the space station. It's moving it's fast. <laughs> no, it's, well, you gotta practice. You gotta practice, right? Astronomy waits for no one. I mean, you, you, it's not, it's not, or you gotta work at this, right? So I know you have to, you, I know it's fast. So here's my trick. I like to use an, at least an 8 inch telescope, but it doesn't matter because all you need is about 30 power to see the space station. If you look at heavensabove.com or CalSky, find a pass, and there are evening passes starting up in about a week. Find a pass that's straight overhead. Now you think, oh good, straight overhead, close. No, that's not when you want to look at it because it's screaming along so fast you'll never track it. But on the overhead passes, they are coming at you from far away and they're going like this. And their apparent motion across the sky is relatively small. So I like to catch them when they're pretty far away, right? 600 miles, 700 miles away. But their apparent motion across the sky is relatively slow, relatively slow. And I can catch it and I can move the telescope and I let it drift through and I catch it, I move it and I let it drift through. It's possible. I used, I, when I was a kid, I used to practice on jets. I used to take my telescopes out in the daytime and practice on jets and how the telescope moved and how it felt. But it can be done, and with moderate power, you can see the solar panels, you can see the modules. It's pretty cool. Yeah, jets back there? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, they had jets. A couple. A couple. It was in the paint one, they're going to come by. So, anyway, where do you begin? Sky and Telescopes have got some great resources, nice moon maps, the Moon 100 card. So does Astronomy Magazine. I put that in there for Glenn. Right? <laughs> um, there are some pretty cool atlases of the moon, Google's atlases, I think, out of print, but you can still get a hold of those. And uh, Charles Wood's uh, Atlas of the Moon, 21st Century Atlas of the Moon, are, are, are great resources. Um, you can also go online. I love Moon Globe HD. I think it cost me $2.99, but it was a, it was a worthy uh, investment. And then on the, on the web, the lunar um, quick map. Um, that's lunar reconnaissance orbiter imaging. And if you really want to get close to the moon, if you really want to see the flag, then find the latitude and launch through the landing sites and go there. And you see things like this. That's the Apollo 11 landing site. This is a big crater that Neil was trying to get across as he was landing. And so they set down there, you can see their little footprints where they set stuff up. I don't know where the flag was because it certainly blew over when they, when they took off. But you can get that close, you can look at, the, you can look at the, the lunar landing sites. And the other thing I like to do with that on cloudy nights, when the moon isn't in the sky, is I like to really explore the moon. Remember my favorite real estate, Mount Python? On the northeast flank of Python, there are boulders that have rolled down the side of the hill. And you can actually see these tracks. And all these boulders right here, they're just not, they're just not there for no reason. They used to be up on top of that hill, little hill, that ultimately rolled down to the bottom of the hill. Sometimes when I look at those tracks on, on, um, on Luna Quick Map, I think to myself, if we were an astronaut, say a 23rd century astronaut doing something 
over here. You wouldn't even hear this thing coming. Right. <laughs> right. Remember, the air is air is body. You wouldn't even hear it coming. Right. You'd probably feel it thumping down the hill. I'm just going to get out of the way because that's a big rock. That's, that's not little. And, and here's one last big rock. I'm surprised the image is Murray. You've got to get that telescope pointed at the moon. You've got to do it. You gotta it just just burn it it's, it it's gotta have some kind of exposure control on the camera. <laughs> the problem is that you can't see for about a week. No, I know. Yeah. <laughs> what are the we're we're in, in, in complex craters when they form? <laughs> in complex craters, they form mountain peaks in the center of the craters. Copernicus has got some beautiful mountain peaks, and so does Tycho. And for some crazy reason, at the at the top of like those central peaks. There's a rock sitting there. That's, a, that's about the size of a really big house. And so it's, I don't know that, I'm, and I'm not throwing down the challenge, I don't know if you could even hope to resolve something like that from Earth. But um, these are taken with lunar, uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. But you can explore that website and go as deep to the moon and all this as you want. And um, well, that's it. You know, you can you can use your naked eye, you can use binoculars, you can use a telescope, and um, I put this up as not so much the end of the, the presentation, but the beginning, because I really want you guys to get excited about the moon, even just once in a while. It was what we all started with. It was pictures like this when I was a kid um, that kind of inspired me to get into astronomy a little bit. And when I first looked at the moon, holy cow, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe my little telescope showed me that kind of detail. And your telescopes will show you the same amount of detail, not more. So I, that's what I would like you guys to do, you folks to do, is to get out there and at least once in a while, go revisit your old friend, because it's there almost all the time, and it's a fun thing to explore. Yes, sir? You missed one whole slide that you will love to put in there. Which one? Using the moon as a landmark during the day to see Jupiter. Well, sure. I mean, you, should, you, you need a slide. Well, remember, this is, this is going to be at the conjunction. This is the 20-minute version. But yeah, I didn't think about daytime landmarks, because if you want to find Venus in the daytime, or Jupiter in the daytime, right. or Mars when it's at its you know, brightest in the daytime, we well, get the moon nearby so you can actually see it. You have to use a starless if you have to. It's a, it's a great, uh, since it's easy to see the moon in the daytime sky, if, it's, if it happens to be nearby one of the planets, um, that's a quick way to find it. Awesome. Um, the other thing I was going to I'm going to mention in conjunction, we had a nice trick for observing the moon in the daytime, especially around the first and last quarter. We used it at at, at New England Sci Tech. Well, I did at least. I put a polar a single element polarizing filter into my eyepiece, and because the sky has a natural polarization polarization that's maximum at 90 degrees away from the sun, when the moon is at its quarter phase or thereabouts, 90 degrees away from the sun. You can use a single Polaroid filter or telescope to dial out that skylight. And what it does is it darkens the background. It improves contrast. The moon's light is scattered light, so it's not polarized. It has a minimal filtering effect, but you can really enhance the view during the daytime. Um, it just improves the contrast tremendously. Have, have you tried there. a red filter? I've never tried a red filter. No, no, a, pol a single element. I've never tried a, pol a red one, but I use the polarizing filter. A single element polarizing filter. They're probably like, 15 bucks at a line. Here's a neutral density filter. Well, you could do that too, but that will, that will just, that cuts everything. So, uh, the, yeah, the, and, and you're right, sometimes it, looking at a full moon, stop for it. Stop the telescope down, stack two or three neutral density filters together because it's blindingly bright. Wear sunglasses. Wear sunglasses if you want, sure. <laughs> but I get it, Mark. I know that's why you don't take images of the moon. It's, it's, it's an overpowering um, presence in the sky. Sorry about that. When they're kids, we feel bad at winning lottery. Yeah, yeah. You can stop down your telescope too. And sometimes I'll do that. Heaven forbid. Heaven forbid. And it pay for all that class, right? Anyway, that's all I have to offer you this evening. I hope um, I hope uh, it wasn't terribly technical, but Jim. So for when it's when it's cloudy, I'm not going to discourage anybody to go out. No, it's only cloudy like 65, 75, 70 percent of the time. So, <laughs> In preparation for Apollo, for, for the Apollo landings, there's the Lunar Orbiter project in the 1960s, um, well before the time of some of the people in this room. Um, and um, that actually had, had remarkably good resolution. So Dennis Wingo et al, uh, some years back, five or six years ago, 
managed to track down the original data tapes from Lunar Orbiter and redigitize them all. Oh, cool. It turns out that Lunar Orbiter photographs are very close to the same resolution as the, as the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter photographs taken 40 years later. Um, and they cleaned them up. They're now in the National Archives. You can get out all the imagery. Uh, and you can do things like like look for new craters, mm -hmm. right? Or new rocks that have wandered down the slope. Sure. Yeah. So there's a lot of things like that that, that can be done. There's some interesting science that you do there if you're, if you're so inclined to do with the moon as well, uh, courtesy of that project. So don't, it turns out, don't ignore lunar orbiter. No, no. It's about as good as the, the within spitting distance of something that was done 40 years later. Right. Fantastic. <laughs> Which is just fantastic. Well, you know, you talk about new craters. Um, recall back that in the, the January eclipse, um, some observers saw a flash of light yeah. uh, during totality, which was the visual release of energy from an impact. But there's 40 years of accumulation between those. So you can go back to the They do it on Mars now. Yeah. They're doing it on Mars with, um, with the, 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 the imaging satellites they have. And they find new craters every now and again on Mars by just a very old day. If I remember correctly, uh, Dennis said that the rocks that you could see on uh, the lunar orbiter photographs were only like, say, a order of three meters diameter. Uh, they, they needed to look for things that that uh, the uh, might tip over the a land, right, that right, they were right. They critically concerned with that. Well, but Neil Neil talked about you know yeah, moving over a boulder field. Right. Yeah, right. right. And I, I don't know what it would take to knock or to not tip one over, but just to make for a bad day. You know, just a few seconds of fuel left, too. Right, you're, you're running out of fuel fast. About 30 seconds of fuel. Yeah. Right. 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 No, I just, just noticed the, the link on your bottom of the picture there. It says Bonstel mm -hmm. Destination Moon. And one of the TV stations just was reproducing that, playing that back. Oh, wow. By George Powell. I was about 12 years old right. then. <laughs> and wow. It, it's so bad now from what I thought was wonderful. Turner, Turner Classic Movies, I, I don't, want, don't know what night of the week it is, but they're right now, they're, I, I can't, you have to look up their schedule. But there's one night a week they're showing like three old, you know, the, the other night it was The Day the Earth Stood Still, War of the Worlds, and Forbidden Planet. <laughs> so you, you want to go down memory lane. Yeah. Go check, and you're right, the, the special effects are hokey in some of them. But uh, they're, they're, those are great, great classics. When I was amazed uh, many years ago, I knew that uh, during the Apollo era, uh, the Russians had an enormous rocket and it blew up on the path. And people were supposedly killed in that, but they tried to cover it up. The CIA did find out about it and published a little bit, but no details. Well, now Channel 2 has pictures of that rocket. It had 30 motors in a circle around it. Wow. Incredibly yeah, big The M1 was a hell of a big rocket. Um, I don't believe anybody was killed during any of their attempted launches. There was, however, a launch of another rocket the Russians had where they lost like uh, one, you know, an order of 100 people due to a general who was, uh, shall we say, you could not say no to. Thankfully, he also paid you know, <laughs> yeah, price that day. for his orders. Well, that's a down the word. Yes. Well, we're being, we're being inundated with, with moon stuff this month, of course. Of course. Um, which is great, which is fantastic. Um, so it's a good month, to, like I said, to go um, and revisit an old friend. And, um, who, uh, Steve, did you mention the three craters from the uh, yeah. Moon? So those are those are visible as well uh, in the Sea of Tranquility. I was just looking at the Apollo 17 uh, landing site the other night um, as best I could. Um, it's a pretty; those guys landed in a pretty tight little spot, and uh, it's just kind of fun stuff to be able to take out your telescope and to look at some of these features and to just kind of explore the moon on your own. You know, it's, it's when the moon's in the sky, it's my favorite object to look at. And so hopefully um, you'll get your telescopes out, your binoculars, just, you know, your curiosity hopefully has been piqued. 
Um, you visit an old friend, don't forget your space station homework. I'll be checking in September. That's <laughs> the kids. Anyway, thanks very much, guys. our evening. Um, I did want to give a shout out to Maria Baptista for, for uh, work she's done on refreshments and she has a special surprise for us. Um, I don't know if we're going to bring Maria in or not, but maybe we should. Um, but I want to thank again all the speakers. They put a lot of time and effort into it. I thought it was really nice. So thanks. See you in September. Is that a song?